the cholera not only, I mean, the main way cholera kills you is it dehydrates you. So rehydration therapy is absolutely crucial. And if you can't get any supplies in the country, these children are just left to die. And keep in mind, these children are often older than they appear because their growth has been stunted. I believe the, picture, the child in the first picture was six years old. To me, he looks like he's about three. So, um, so this blockade has led to the deaths of at least 113,000 children who died of hunger and preventable diseases since 2016 in a country that used to import 90% of its food like before the crisis began uh, and was already water stressed. The impact of the land, sea, and air blockade imposed by the coalition has been devastating. That's according to Shireen Aladami's April 11th article. She's a Yemeni doctoral student at Harvard who survived two civil wars in that country. And it's not even a simple matter of keeping humanitarian aid out of the country. Even if every, all the bit, every bit of aid that was meant to go to Yemen got there, um, the situation would still be dire because of the economic warfare that's been waged on this country for years. Um, in, according to Helen Lackner's new book, uh, Yemen in Crisis, which I highly recommend, is a great, it's a great source of information. Um, she, she says, the economic warfare against the Central Bank of Yemen prevented commercial importers from getting the letters of credit necessary to buy grains on the international market. Leaders of the warring factions prioritized military objectives over the needs of Yemeni men, women, and children. The international community complacently allowed this situation to persist to the greater benefit of arms traders, us, and UK and France and others, uh, fuel and food smugglers and other war profiteers. In short, the Yemeni people are trying to survive in a nightmare world of very limited water, food, and medical services. And even if they can somehow survive all that, they, they still have cholera, other diseases, and an apparently um, indiscriminate bombing campaign trying to kill them off. Hellscape, I don't think, is it's too strong a word. Well, the situation is, res is unfolding there as a result of a complex regional history and political actions taken by its own government and others throughout the Middle East and the rest of the world. Just a very brief history lesson before we move on. Um, uh, Yemen's current history begins in 1990. It was newly unified under President Ali Abdullah Saleh. Um, but it quickly fell to civil war in 1993 when unable to reconcile the differences between its former northern and southern governments. After the southern forces based in Aden, which is at the southern end of the country and used to be a, a, a British colony, um, after it swiftly fell against Salah's advancing armies, which included elements of uh, uh, excuse me, jihadi forces that would later become uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and yet yeah, all of Yemen fell under the rule of Saleh, who was an autocrat whose regime has become notorious for its corruption. Saleh was highly skilled at playing his enemies against one another and enlisting the help of the international community in general, and the U.S. in particular, by convincing them that the country would descend into the chaos of radical Islamic terrorism without him. He was even sagacious enough to ally himself with the al-Houthi rebels, his former opponents, in 2015 against the Saudi forces until his death at their hands the, um, in December of last year. The Houthi wars have been going on since 2004, but the most recent conflict began in Yemen's northern provinces in 2015. The UN responded by passing Resolution 2216, which was supposed to um, stop the rebellion and call an end to the conflict. Um, Saudi Arabia has since that time been leading a coalition, of which the US has been a part from the beginning, to fight the Houthi rebels who now control most of the country, including its capital Sana'a, and most of the country's population. Um, Saudi Arabia claims it has been leading the war in order to protect its southern border and as a way to um, combat their enemy Iran, who they claim is funding the Houthi rebels. There is some evidence that the Houthi forces are being, um, are being supplied um, help from Iranian actors, but this has been greatly exaggerated and there's not even any uh, indication that uh, any um, Governmental body is helping the al Houthis at all. There are, and there are no Yemeni forces, excuse me, there are no Iranian forces in Yemen at all. So, despite these technological advances of the Saudi coalition, 
Um, the war has remained in a stalemate for years. Uh, and, I wouldn't. I don't pretend that there are any easy solutions to everything that's going on there. Um, the Houthis are no angels. I mean, they're they're also contributing to the humanitarian crisis. Uh, they, uh, including uh, bombing and indiscriminately civilian targets uh, using human shields. But but realistically, what they do pales in comparison to what is being carried out by the coalition funded by our money. Um, so despite the fact that there may not be an overall, overarching, easy solution to fix everything, there's, there are some pretty easy conclusions that we can reach. Um, number one, the U.S. should stop participating in the destruction of this country. At this point, it's clear that the direct assistance that the U.S. military is giving to the Saudis, the arms sales to that country, which exceed $200 billion, and the crushing blockade maintained with the U.S. help is not only killing swaths of the Yemeni population, but in most instances, instances is unlawful also. President Trump claims that selling weapons to the Saudis will generate jobs here in the U.S. Now, even if we believe him, that's absolutely no excuse for the slow destruction of an entire population. <clears throat> the United States holds significant power over Saudi Arabia and has for a long time. If we told them to stop, they would. It's pretty much that simple. The United, um, so even something as simple as the cessation of mid-air refueling by Saudi aircraft, which is crucial for the, for the Saudi's air force, even something like that would bring, bring the bombing campaign to a swift end. So to quote Helen Lackner again, at this point, the Yemeni people will basically settle for anything that means an end to the war that has given them nothing but death and destruction. Like so much horror that takes place outside of um, our national boundaries as a result of either U.S. participation or indifference, it's not the ability that we lack to end these atrocities, but the willpower. Thank you. Um, oh. <laughs> um, I'd, like, I'd like now to welcome Dr. Kuzmarov. Thank you very much for doing it. Thank you. And it should be noted, yeah, I, I will not be at the University of Tulsa anymore uh, because they don't want these topics uh, covered. And some of you know that uh, I've, we've had many events there. However, no other faculty or administrators ever attended those events and were also very hostile, uh, uh, even though these important issues have been discussed uh, and the students have enjoyed uh, discussing these issues. Uh, many students are interested. Uh, so I, I think, you know, we've seen a, 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 a washout in the media. Uh, I think there's an attempt, not only in the media, but I think people have to recognize also in the educational system uh, to block out these topics. Uh, and what we have is a public that is blithely unaware and that can believe the propaganda we hear about Iran and the threats from Russia, and nobody looks into what the United States is actually doing in the world and how we can easily as Chris was pointing out, stop a lot of this by withdrawing our taxpayer dollars for these uh, kinds of atrocities. Yemen, uh, as we know, is currently facing a biblical type humanitarian catastrophe. 50,000 children are believed to have died this year, including from cholera. Eight million are on the brink of famine, and two million people have been displaced. A Saudi-led coalition is seeking to install Abrabah Mansour Hadi as president, against a Shiite-dominated Houthi rebellion, allegedly backed by Saudi's rival Iran. Saudi Arabia has meddled incessantly in Yemeni politics since the 1960s and has strove to advance its Wahhabist version of Sunni Islam throughout the Arab world. The Houthis currently control the bulk of the northern highlands and Yemen's capital at Sana'a. Yemen has a history of being a graveyard for outside power, somewhat like Afghanistan, including Egypt in the 1960s under Gamal Abdel Nasser, who also underestimated the scale of resistance to the government he was trying to impose at that time. The Saudis told the United so this is a folly if we look at Yemen's history. The Saudis told the United States their war would be over in six weeks, much like the Soviets thought about Afghanistan, the Germans and French World War I, and the United States, Vietnam, and Iraq. 
Yemen has erupted into war following the Arab Spring of 2011 when Yemenis dislodged long-standing ruler Ali Abdullah Saleh, who had led the country since 1978 and unified the North and South in the 1990s. Saleh was a former tank commander who built his military base through a controlling stake in the army's trade in bootleg alcohol. He opened the country up to foreign exploitation, and this is something that rarely gets discussed, he opened the country up to foreign exploitation, including U.S. oil interests, and was skilled at manipulating the country's mixture of tribes, religious groups, and interested foreign parties, a feat he called dancing on the heads of snakes. The U.S. had assisted Salah in crushing the first Houthi rebellion and provided over $100 million in military assistance in return for his cooperation in targeting al-Qaeda, building him even a Coast Guard from scratch. This cooperation included the assassination of cleric Anwar al-Awlaki, a U.S. citizen, and his 13-year-old son, Abdul Rahman, in Obama's drone war. Led by Abdul Malik al-Houthi, who was recently killed, the Houthis supported the Arab Spring and had mounted consistent rebellions in the attempt to restore the traditional power of their Zayda clan, which had predominated prior to the 60s Civil War, and because they had legitimate grievances against the Saleh government and his successor Hadi, who the U.S. and Saudis are trying to impose, he was also Saleh's vice president for 20 years, and one Middle East expert referred to him as Empire's Man. So many Yemenis, and this is not how the war is covered in our media, view this government as a foreign imposition on their country, an extension of the rule of Saleh, who was very corrupt, as has been noted before although was quite savvy uh, to, to remain in power for all those years. The U.S. and Saudis have played up Iranian backing of the Houthi. However, Zaydism is doctrinally distinct from the mainstream Shiite Islam practiced in Iran, so it doesn't make sense. Uh, Thomas Juno is an expert on Iranian foreign policy. He wrote an article in the Washington Post titled, No, Yemen's Houthis actually aren't Iranian puppets. Uh, he said that Tehran's support for the Houthis is limited and its influence in Yemen is marginal. It is simply inaccurate to claim that the Houthis are Iranian proxies. Uh, another excellent book by, uh, I would recommend is by Issa Blumi. Called, uh, he's a professor at the University of Stockholm who uh, specializes in Turkish affairs. His book is called Destroying Yemen, What Chaos in Arabia Tells Us About the World, published by the University of California Press this year. He writes that the Houthi by 2013 were part of a larger coalition that included Saleh himself and his loyalists, a major swath of the Yemeni military, and political alliance of disaffected public sector workers and tribal militias. So it's a very broad coalition opposing the uh, Saudi-backed incursion. This coalition felt aggrieved by the unaccept, besides representing the interests of the Zayda clan, it's a broad coalition that felt aggrieved by the unacceptable conditions under Hadi's government and by years of neoliberalism that resulted in Yemen's impoverishment following a period of successful local development initiatives in the 70s under Ibrahim al Hamdi, who ruled from 1974 to 77. So, in Blumi's narrative, uh, which is somebody who really knows the region, uh, uh, Hamdi was a leader who was really trying to promote local development, but the country turned towards neoliberalism, the kind of austerity we've seen in Oklahoma. During Hadi's rule, really had a number of assassinations and bombing of mosques frequented by Zaydi Muslims increased, while poverty, unemployment, and property confiscations grew to epidemic proportions. With no parliamentary oversight, Hadi had taken it upon himself to impose economic liberalization reforms which put many of Yemen's public assets up for sale and slashed public services, which hurt the poorest, most vulnerable, much like we've seen with austerity policies undertaken by the GOP here in Oklahoma. Bloomy writes that a broad coalition backed by the Houthi amidst this backdrop, quote, throughout the corrupt regime, foreign-imposed government of Hadi filled with crooks and Islamist bigots and reversed the selling of Yemen's economic future. Though this was not the way the rebellion or war has been presented at all in Western media. In a desperate effort to restore Hadi's rule and keep Yemen subordinate, the Saudis have, as mentioned, mercilessly bombed civilian infrastructure in Yemen with the goal of starving the population into submission. 
Amal Sabri, a resident of Mocha, described an airstrike which killed at least 63 civilians. He said it was like something out of Judgment Day. Corpses and heads scattered engulfed by fire and ashes. Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia's destructive policy has sadly been aided and abetted by the United States, which has provided intelligence for bomb targeting, pilot training, and refueling assistance for Saudi planes, as well as smart bombs and other ordnance, some of which yeah, was produced here probably in Oklahoma, and that has been used to kill and maim civilians. The U.S. Army boasts 123 contracts in Saudi Arabia, totaling more than $120 million per month. The U.S. furthermore, as the New York Times reported, has sent Green Berets, who train Saudi units and have allegedly helped to locate and destroy Houthi caches of ballistic missiles and launch sites the Houthis are using to attack the Saudis. The Pentagon has claimed it doesn't engage in combat but only helps Saudis to defend their border. Though the Pentagon has claimed the same thing before in other secret wars it has waged. During the secret war in Laos, for example, in the Indochina War, special force troops partook in combat with Hmong regular units and ordered bounties for the cutting off of enemy ears. Uh, so how do we know this isn't going on again? Probably it is because we were just told now that there's Green Berets there. They've been there for several years. And in the past, we're always told, oh, they're just advisors. Well, again, we know from history that those advisors uh, are often involved in combat and, and some very dirty operations that could even include things like bounty hunter uh, type stuff. The US has supplied the Saudis with white phosphorus, an incendiary adopted in the Vietnam and Iraq war that burns through the skin to the bone. An undisclosed experiment also saw use of thermobaric bunker bombs that destroyed an entire neighborhood in the first weeks of the Saudi-led military campaign. These ordinances are not in the Saudi arsenal, so must have come from the United States. The Obama administration in 2010 and 2011 provided the Saudis with 1,700 cluster bombs as part of million-dollar arms packages that the Washington Post reported have been used to shatter Yemeni lives, including children. Cluster bombs, for some of you who were around from that era, were a focal point of anti-war protest when used in the Vietnam War and are banned in 119 countries. But they're not banned in the United States nor Saudi Arabia. They're banned because they release hundreds of small bomblets that are timed to go off later and to maximize civilian casualties. On January 6, 2016, Essa Al-Farasi, a lanky teen who loved soccer, was among those killed when he was walking home innocently from a mosque following sunrise prayer. We heard the explosions and when we came out, Essa was lying on the ground, the imam recalled. I carried his body to the car. I felt the blood coming out, but he was still breathing. Essa died upon arrival at the hospital. A few blocks away in a poor area with crumbling buildings, Fragments of the cluster bomb tore through the corrugated tin roof of Shakir Galeb Ahmed's apartment. I woke up and saw blood all over me, the bakery worker uh, uh, recalled. He would spend the next 15 days in the hospital bed after doctors removed the shrapnel that punctured his liver and lungs. Alex Emans and Muhammad Ali Kalfoud, and the Intercept's very good uh, online media source. Alex Emans has been covering this issue very well. Uh, and he uh, wrote uh, an article about the killing of Ali Muhammad Juba Medarij, a 34-year-old fisherman who was sleeping in his boat after netting his day's catch when he was struck and killed by a cluster munition al Haima in western Yemen. Researchers from Human Rights Watch later identified the shell casings as a U.S.-made cluster bomb, which was produced by the Rhode Island-based company Textron Systems. UK made cluster munitions have also been used to cripple and maim Yemeni civilians. In a country dependent on imports for the majority of its food, American backed Saudi strikes against Yemen's fishing industry have taken a particularly devastating toll, as Emens has reported. Fishing has declined in the Hodeida government, the province where Al Haima is located, by 75%. Um, the, the, that region is at the highest risk for famine, and the UN estimates that 100,000 children under age 5 are at risk of severe malnutrition. Nearly 300 of this particular village, uh, 1,600 children are malnourished, according to local medical staff. And the Saudi-led coalition keeps attacking fishermen, accusing them of smuggling Iranian weapons to the Houthi. 
in one attack uh, with a, a t Apache hel helicopter, 42 fishermen uh, were killed and maybe as many as 100. During its eight-year tenure from 2008 to 2016, the Obama administration provided a record $115 billion in arms sales to the Saudis and over $20 billion in new weapon transfers after the Saudi bombing of Yemen began in March 2015. This included a special $1.5 billion shipment of 152 Abrams battle tanks, 20 of which were destined to replenish vehicles from Yemen, and a billion dollar shipment of thousands of bombs to replenish Saudi stocks. The Obama administration also extended a $4 billion effort by the Vanell Corporation, a subsidiary of Northman, Northrop Grumman, to train and equip the Saudi National Guard, which has played a key role in the invasion of Yemen. In Kings and Presidents, a book on the history of U.S.-Saudi relations, the former CIA officer Bruce Rydell writes, that no president since Franklin Roosevelt courted Saudi Arabia as zealously as did Obama. Secretary of State John Kerry, once opposed the war in Vietnam, as a disaffected young soldier, blamed the Houthis for all the deaths in the Saudi war, saying that the Houthis had a way of putting civilians into danger. Kerry has changed a lot over the years. The Trump administration, you know, unfortunately U.S. politics has I think Julius Assange put it best, a choice between gonorrhea and syphilis. So we have Obama, who you know, has a nice facade, but is doing all these horrible things. And then well, instead, to replace him, we get uh, somebody who is far worse, Donald Trump, which has shamelessly expanded the level of arms sales even further than Obama and repealed a temporary restriction on cluster munitions while increasing missile strikes targeting alleged terrorists in Yemen. More than 130 airstrikes were carried out in 2017 alone. Trump's own business connections to Saudi Arabia and those of his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, are hardly hidden and should be investigated more than Trump's alleged ties to Russia, which have not been yet well established. During a trip to the kingdom, according to the Daily Beast, the Saudis presented Trump with lavish gifts including robes lined with tiger and cheetah fur, which preceded his announcement of the billion dollar arms deal that included a reversal of Obama's decision to block the sale of precision guided munitions. After the trip, Raytheon Corporation, the major defense contractor, successfully lobbied the State Department and Congress for a contract to sell 60,000 precision guided missiles, which in the past were used in airstrikes that killed civilians according to Human Rights Watch. Among these strikes was the bombing of a funeral, which resulted in the death of Sama's mayor, Abdel Qadir Hilal al Dabab, and 140 others, many of whom were involved in trying to negotiate a truce with the Houthi. The victims were struck by a 500 pound paveway laser guided explosive produced by Raytheon at plants in Arizona and Texas. So, great, created some jobs in Arizona and Texas to eviscerate uh, a funeral. Uh, and kill the people who are trying to actually negotiate to end that conflict. George Orwell would surely be proud of Secretary of Defense James Mattis, who urged Congress that restrictions on military aid would increase civilian casualties. <laughs> civilian casualties, we know, have been horrendous. Uh, I mean, I think one reason the lack of concern for the latter is attributed to dehumanization of the Yemeni population and, and Middle East people in general as terrorists and part of backwards culture. Uh, Edgar O'Balance, uh, you know, in researching this topic, I was reading a bunch of books even on the Yemeni civil war of the 60s. And one a writer is a British author. The book was actually pretty good, but he started out by, he characterized, and this is a book written like around 1990, he characterized Yemen's nationalist leader, Imam Ahmed, whom the Bloomy book actually depicts very favorably as more of a nationalist, uh, Balance depicts him as a barbaric despot and said that of all the countries I had traveled, none gave me such a feeling of being suddenly carried back in time to the Middle Ages. So, you know, we think of them as backwards and we can justify all these atrocities. The dehumanization of Yemeni people is epitomized further in the country's status as the Tijuana of Arabia, where wealthy businessmen travel to sleep with local prostitutes. A hidden aspect of the U.S. involvement in the war in Yemen, which I learned a lot about uh, for this talk, is its arms sales to the United Arab Emirates. And this people should look up and should have more scrutiny 
and more congressmen who are opposing the war should oppose this as well. Uh, UAE has trained, paid, and equipped more than 25,000 Yemeni soldiers and has 15,000 of its own special forces operating in Yemen and has also funded 1,000 Sudanese troops, including notorious Janjaweed militias that are under U.S. sanctions for human rights abuses and hundreds of Colombian mercenaries. God knows how many worked for the Colombian drug cartel. The United States is estimated to have made offers to sell the UAE $27 billion worth of arms since 2009, one quarter of the country's arms in that period, including paveway and joint direct attack munitions and tactical missiles such as the Hellfire that have been used in the war in Yemen and also against ISIS. The U.S. has been also a major arms seller and supplier of military training to the UAE, which is considered to be a little Sparta with one of the most capable militaries in the Middle East. Prior to his ascension as Secretary of Defense under Trump, General Mattis served as an unpaid advisor to the UAE military, starting this arrangement when the Saudi UAE intervention in Yemen was already underway. In June 2017, the Associated Press reported that UAE forces and UAE trained militias ran a secret network of prisons in South Yemen where alleged Al-Qaeda and Houthi suspects were subjected to extreme torture, including through the grill technique in which the victims are tied to a spit-like roast and spun in a circle of fire. The Defense Department was investigating whether U.S. troops, which carried out interrogations at a detention center near the Mukalla Airport, were at all complicit in this. A Washington-based private military contractor, Knowledge International, provided 125 ex-army officers to train UAE land forces that were involved in the war in Yemen. One mercenary, Stephen Tumajan, according to In These Times, commands the UAE military helicopter branch. So it's commanded by an American. Press TV reported, based on interviews with Yemeni officials, that Dyncorp mercenaries arrived in Yemen to fight the Houthi rebels. This was allegedly part of a $3 billion contract with the UAE. Most of you probably know about Dyncor. The Dyncor operatives had allegedly replaced those of Academy, formerly Blackwater, which had been given, or I think Reflex. You know, Prince kept renaming the company uh, to evade scrutiny. He had been given a previous $529 million contract to create a secret mercenary army in the UAE, which defended oil pipelines carried out special operation and was ready to put down any internal revolts against the oil-soaked sheikdom. Dyncorp issued a statement denying its involvement in Yemen when this was reported. However, its website, I went on their website, and it highlights the company's growing capacity in the UAE and support for its aviation program, which it says is done for over 20 years, and advertises numerous jobs in the UAE. So what's it doing in the UAE? This could you know, be used as a cover for clandestine operations. And yes, as a historian, I know, having studied the Indochina Wars, that the CIA would train the border police and forces in Thailand. You know, They could deny that they were in Laos or heavily involved, but they were doing the training out of Thailand and using proxy forces. So I think the same thing is going on now in the UAE. So even if Dyncor denies that they're in Yemen, they are advertising for the UAE and that's where their training forces were being sent into Yemen. And yeah, Dyncor is like Mr. Military Industrial Complex. Its board of directors includes five-star generals like Barry McCaffrey, private equity, equity firms that service air, major aerospace and defense industries, and uh, the Allied Defense Group, whose subsidiaries manufacture ammunition for the use by the U.S. and Allied governments. Its shadowy operations reflect an important modus operandi of U.S. foreign policy, notably the reliance on third country nationals and private military contractors with close ties to the CIA to carry out military operations in support of U.S. strategic objectives. The effect is to distance the U.S. public and avert popular protest while lessening public transparency. The media has long been fixated with the abuse of Syrian Prime Minister Bashir al-Assad and destructive consequences of Russian airstrikes in Syria. However, American actions in Saudi Arabia and Yemen, along with Afghanistan, should be condemned equally and deserve as much attention. 
The victims of the latter wars fit in the category of unworthy victims in the analogy of Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman in their landmark study, Manufacturing Consent, the Political Economy of the Mass Media. The media ignores these unworthy victims since they are victims of U.S. military operations or their proxies, like Saudi Arabia or UAE, and instead it spotlights the worthy victims, those of regimes the U.S. seeks to overthrow, and they can use the humanitarian crisis to build support for military intervention like victims of Assad in Syria, Iran, Venezuela, or in the past Libya under Gaddafi, Iraq under Saddam, or Cubans under Castro. Uh, Bruce Rydell, I'm not to say those atrocities don't exist, but we, we only hear about those. We don't hear about the ones the U.S. participates in. And Chomsky has made the point repeatedly that it's much easier. We can't, you know, there are going to be atrocities that go on in the world, unfortunately, but we can control our own domain and it's much easier to, to, to take away aid to a country like Saudi Arabia. We could have a tangible effect in stopping the atrocities. The Syrian civil war would be more difficult. Bruce Rydell, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, a 30-year uh, CIA officer, explained in a public event that Saudi Arabia is dependent on the U.S. in its bombing campaign, and that if the United States and the United Kingdom tonight told King Sal Salman of Saudi Arabia, this war has to end, it would end that Royal Saudi Air Force cannot operate without American and British support. And this echoes the view of many Yemenis who blame the United States largely for the war. Mohammed Abdullah Sabra, a 42-year-old sales supervisor at a food company, told the New Yorker magazine correspondent, America is, in the is the main sponsor of all that is happening to us. The Gulf countries are merely tools in its hands. Thus, I think, you know, Chomsky's right. There's little we can do to stop atrocities in Syria, like Burma or the Rohingya, except press for diplomatic settlements, which in the case of Syria, we don't th seem to be doing at all. We're arming jihadist extremists and probably prolonging the war and agony of that country. Uh, but again, yeah, there's much we can do to stop the atrocities, so peace movements like ours should focus campaigns on cutting funding to the Saudis and the UAE, uh, with the goal of stopping the atrocities and pushing for a uh, diplomatic settlement uh, to Yemen's conflict um, and, and uh, stop the use of private military contractors there as well. And this should be urgent, not only for the horrible plight of the Yemeni people, but for world security because, um, you know, terrorist groups can take advantage and they're infiltrating the country to uh, become, you know, feed off the chaos and suffering. Daphna H. Rand, the Middle East expert who covered Yemen for the State Department, said, the longer this war goes on, the longer there's a risk of deep resentment against the United States that will be radicalizing and lead to full strain extremism. The Yemenis I spoke to expressed frustration of the U.S. role in the war. We used to love and appreciate the U.S. because a large number of Yemenis lived there. A Barry the Chanter told me, the war has now changed that calculus. What appears to me is that 